Bonjour, je ne suis pas Gaëlle, euh, je suis Nicole et je vis à Paris, mais je suis une Américaine stupide qui ne parle pas français. First of all, it's Gael's birthday and that coupled with the fact that I spent all day Monday traveling and losing nine hours of time as a result of that travel is why we traded days this week. She mentioned once that she wanted to hear me speak French, so there it is in all of its humiliating glory. Happy birthday. I took notes on all the things that we've talked about this week because I'm kind of in love with this topic. I actually just got back from my identity formation in a transnational world class. I'm going to try to get through as much of this as possible with the understanding that I'm probably not going to get through everything and I have to edit stuff out and also with the understanding that I am wasting time right now. The fact that we brought up everything from fragmented identities to a reference to Judith Butler performativity in Emily's video yesterday pretty much sums up how awesome our little channel is. On Monday, Gael asked about how being abroad has changed us, and I have a couple different parts to my answer to this question, but I will start by saying that I don't feel that my experience now being abroad in Paris has been as transformative as my undergraduate experience of being abroad in Ghana was. This isn't to say that being abroad now hasn't already changed me in considerable ways, only that my undergraduate study abroad experience was really, really transformative. My undergraduate study abroad experience has profoundly shifted a lot of the way that I see the world in terms of things like discourses of privilege, which is the asinine thing that I keep bringing up in the identity class, and I now I'm just kind of afraid to speak because I've become that person. But this in turn has shaped the way that a lot of my subsequent life experiences have affected me, chiefly academically, but like in life too, if any of that even makes sense. Like the things that follow can't shape me as deeply because they shape me because of that in certain ways. This is ridiculously convoluted already, I'm sorry. <laughs> Gail also talked about fragmented identities, and this is kind of related to all of the kids who live in the internet talk that has been pervasive throughout all of our videos on this topic so far. Yesterday, Emily brought up the fact that the internet has caused people from our generation to see identity fundamentally different than people from generations before us. Like, Brittany was talking about how differently she comes across online versus offline. And oh my goodness, all of the feelings that I have about the use of the phrase in real life, but that's like another video in and of itself. Just in terms of volume and how outgoing she comes across, Emily kind of plus one that, and I would also say the same. Fun fact, I actually had to show the video in which I dressed up for the Hunger Games to one of my graduate classes. That wasn't awkward at all. And my professor actually commented on how differently I spoke and the fact that I wasn't wearing my glasses. And all sorts of other things about how my self-presentation was different in my video versus what he saw in the awkward, nervous, trembling girl giving a presentation. And on a related note, just look at how quickly we've all gotten to know each other. It's something that I think all of us would agree we would not have done if we were interacting offline instead of in this lovely little box here. Emily was attributing a lot of this to the fact that we can edit things, and I think that this has a lot to do with her point about the way that our generation sees things differently. We seek out this editing control because we are a generation whose lives have been, in a lot of different ways, archived. I don't think my mom edits herself on Facebook anywhere near as consciously as I do. I can pull up diary entries that I wrote when I was in middle school and be confronted with this past construction of myself. I know when I am putting things on the internet that I will have to face them later. Having lived in the internet for most of my life, this has implications for the way that I present myself both online and off. I think that the presence of this archive forces us, in ways different from previous generations, to constantly reconcile this narrative of ourselves. That is, you can't easily disavow some past love or favorite or whatever when a record of it exists. This in turn makes you think a little bit differently about what things you choose to present. In some ways this is a counterpoint to the whole notion of the internet giving us an opportunity to perform an endless array of selves, because basically what I'm saying is that there is a permanent record of the ones that we choose. I am not necessarily disagreeing with a view that espouses multiple performances so much as I am presenting another side to the discussion. Going back to Gael's question about how being abroad has changed me and applying it to this particular stretch of my expat experiences, I don't think it should be any big surprise at this point in time that I value my words. In fact, this channel's first video has me saying, I love all the words. Having a grasp on words, being able to use my words as it were, being articulate is such a core part of how I see myself that being without it is jarring in a way that I never could have imagined. This brings me back to the intro to this particular video. I could go on forever about the list of reasons that I have failed to learn French, some of which are my fault, some of which aren't. The point is it has been an absolutely insane experience for me to find myself incapacitated in this way. I kind of live inside my own head anyway, and this lack of speech has kind of forced me further inward, which in turn only contributes to the whole vicious cycle of my lack of fluency. When I returned to Ghana, though, I was astonished to discover just how much fonty that I retained, even though I'd never used it once I left Ghana. I didn't even realize that I used it that much when I was there. I think it has a lot to do with how differently I was perceived in that setting versus this setting. There, it was a pleasant surprise when I was able to speak fonty, and people got excited and they were eager to help me learn new words and teach me things and encourage me. Here, however, when I am unable to speak French, it is an unpleasant surprise because I lack the sort of inherent visible otherness that I had there. And I have a pretty terrible disposition for dealing with that sort of reprimand. Like I said before, I draw inward, vicious cycle, blah blah blah. Rhiannon, I don't really have a question for you, but I am excited to see where you take this conversation. It's pretty fantastic and complicated enough that we could easily keep talking about this for weeks on end. But for now, Rhiannon, I will see you tomorrow.